All right, everybody's slowly trickling in. Welcome everyone. We're going to give it just another 30 or so seconds and we're going to get started. Welcome everyone to the Sex Work Donor Collaborative and Global Network of Sex Work Projects webinar, Supporting Sex Workers' Rights in the Time of COVID-19, Threats and Opportunities. My name is Erin Williams and I go by she, her pronouns, and I'm the Program Director of Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights at Global Fund for Women. Global Fund for Women is a feminist fund working alongside the network of women's funds globally, and we are a very proud member of the Sex Work Donor Collaborative. The Sex Work Donor Collaborative is a network of funders that have come together to increase the amount and quality of funding to support sex workers' rights. We achieve this through strategic coordination of grant making, research, and advocacy, in partnership with sex worker led organizations and networks. We have 16 plus private and public foundations, including donors from a range of different sectors, um, such as sex worker rights, women's rights, anti trafficking, human rights, LGBTQI rights, and humanitarian response. And we are always welcoming new members. The global network of sex work projects, NSWP is a membership organization currently with 282 sex worker led organizations across 85 countries organized in five regions. It exists to uphold the voice of sex workers, amplify the voices of sex worker led organizations globally, and connects regional networks advocating for the rights of female, male, and transgender sex workers. This is our first webinar together, and it was an absolute must. As human rights funders, we need to pay particular attention to sex workers' lived realities and listen from a place of radical solidarity. In fact, listening is a political act, as Uhai makes clear, and it is the most critical role we can have right now to spur action from us as donor allies, or as I like to say, co-conspirators, to fund the leadership of sex workers invite their leadership into the advocacy spaces that we're in and ensure that we use the clarity of this moment to strengthen cross movement work that will be essential to creating a more democratic, rights affirming and just world. Our panel discussion has three speakers and it will be interwoven with two to three minute videos from five sex workers around the globe who are representatives of the global network of sex work projects, regional networks, and then we aim to have lots of time for Q&A, hence the 75 minute time frame. And as a reminder, this is a funder only space, a solicitation free space, a rights based space, and this webinar is being recorded. Um, and we also encourage you to live tweet using the hashtags on your screen. And we do have a crisis response plan in place in case we encounter any trolls. And so feel free to ask questions throughout the discussion in the chat box. We'll be collecting them and collating them and able to respond to them. And even if we can't get to some of them, we will be recording those questions so that we can use them to design additional learning opportunities for funders. And to mitigate in advance, if we can, not always possible, but any tech lags um, and to support those of us whose first language may not be English, I'd like to remind our speakers to speak a little bit slower than usual. Finally, I just want to acknowledge the severity of this moment that we're in 
and the tremendous pressure that we're all under. And the lives that have been lost in sex worker communities around the world. Uh, there are people that are no longer with us to co-create our feminist futures together. And I want to give a moment of silence for them. Thank you. And with that, I'd love to introduce our first video. This comes from Kayan Dora Show. She's from Glitz, USA. Hi, I'm Kayan Dora Show, founder of Glitz, Inc that's gays and lesbians living in a transgender society. I'm doing this video because in the direct response to COVID-19, so many of our community members have passed away. This pandemic has put us in a very bad situation. I'm a sex worker advocate and doing this work as a founder of an agency, I suffer to get funding. In the U.S., we are suffering from not having the adequate funding to not only help sex workers, but people affected by HIV, people that are affected by homelessness. What Glitz is doing right now as a frontline agency, we're helping people get out of jail. We're helping people get out of jail and into sustainability with a plan. The U.S. really needs your funding. What we're looking at right now is just a prelude to a very bad case. What's gonna happen when COVID is over is the numbers in HIV are gonna go up, the numbers in sexual abuse is gonna go up, domestic violence has already gone up. We need your help. There's no other way to say it than me being responsible enough to tell you to please help us. Please help us in ways that make sense. Please donate and be a part. Thank you. Thanks, KN, for that message. Uh, I think it was a really amazing message to start our webinar off. Um, and what I think was so important about what she said is, is that right now what we're looking at is just a prelude. And there are going to be more additional impacts to come specifically affecting sex workers. She mentioned HIV, she mentioned incarceration and sexual abuse. And in fact, I think the tagline for this webinar could actually be, please help us in ways that make sense. So quality funding for sex workers is critical at this point. And I'd like to introduce now our first speaker, um, Katie Wynn. KT Wynn is the elected president of the Global Network of Sex Work Projects, regional coordinator of the Asia Pacific Network of Sex Workers. She is also the founder and technical advisor of I Myanmar Association, a sex worker led organization in Myanmar. Finally, she sits on the International Steering Committee of the Red Umbrella Fund, representing Asia and the Pacific. Kathy, I know you want to speak to us a little bit more about COVID-19 um, and the lived realities of sex workers. Please take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Yeah, um, thank you for the giving me opportunity and also for the inviting. You know, it's uh, in around the COVID-19 pandemic and have the uh, the sex worker have facing the loss of problem in mean, including the male, female, and transgender sex worker around the world. And also in the many countries, the government has uh, closed the sex worker workplace, exam brought the nightclub, karaoke, and massage parlor, including the hotel and guest house where the sex worker even can take the, their regular client to make the appointment to go and work. That is since the March 2020. So all the sex worker having great loss of the, their income, excluding their social support, from the government or the, uh, or the respondent on the social protection. And stay there during the, even the jury, during the, the pandemic time, the state police abused, arresting to the sex worker 
and abusing, who works for the, their daily income and feed the, their family. And also, the, I can see the consequences is also, I do agree with the current that it, the, after the pandemic, what we can see that the, maybe they increase the HIV and, and also the unwanted pregnancy and violence. That will be the continuously consequence that we will be, sex worker will be the affected. And also why the many sex workers in the cell isolation and it is difficult to stay cell isolation. Whatever we can, how many, uh, many of us have no alternative way to the end. Also the many of our work are in the, the body touch. In the COVID-19 say that how many, three meters, six meters we have to be far. That is not possible for the sex worker and also keeps our cell isolated. And sex worker have to do for what we are doing currently in the nationally and also the regionally, which is linked to the global network of sex worker. The emergency response are the strategy to use the community constituency plan. And they had the, the, some of the donor, very little donor are the plausible to reprogram and support to the emergency response for the sex worker. But many of the donors are fit with the, their, their strategy and their goal, so which is the, we are facing a lot of problem. In the, and sex workers are setting up for the neutral multi funding and also the emergency support to the sex worker who are in the lockdown area and providing the personal protection material and ensuring the sex worker, people who are living with HIV are able to assess the continue that their ARV treatment and also the sex worker community and network and organization are providing the dry food, especially who are in the lockdown area and also they get their medicine and other OI treatment who need it. And also the, some of the sex workers are also the stay and uh, getting arrested by the during this time. I mean, I can tell you that one of the example was the, the one that, the donor, uh, do, some of the donor are uh, trying to be supported in the emergency response, but the government are also the excluding the sex worker on the social support. So, example, I can tell you that the one of our member who are supporting to the sex worker for the dry food and police arrested to the those sex worker and they are taking the those, the dry support that they are getting from the sex worker organization. So I mean, in the in that case, I can see that after that uh, the pandemic time, the HIV and also the and when the pregnancy and also the gender based violence is the stay continually and increase. So as the sex worker community and organization, and I'm seeing for the as the NSWP, how we have to be keep continuing. This is not next five year, we have to be made the come back to the stable right now. So this is how we are facing the problem on the day by day or the infected by the COVID-19. And also the some donor, what we, what I want to say is that in the, the needs of the community and respond of the emergency response. As the community member, we know that we, are, we can ensure that how we can make sure that to support the needs of sex worker. In this time, we don't need about the, how to make the strategy plan for advocacy. This time we need for the daily life of the food and to feed the family member, to feed the children who are needed and make sure that the sex worker who are infected by the HIV, they, are, they can continue to assess the treatment. So example, I can tell you that one of the, our donors for the APNSW, they keep asking us on the, during this COVID time, what is your next strategy plan for advocacy and treatment? According to that, they are what plan. At this time, I can ignore that those what plan because I am important and it urgently to support the, my community in the grass too. And to support, to make sure the donor are unable to support us in the, this condition. We can't think about the previous last year what we planned it to make advocacy plan for the one year. I can't continue to do it. I hope the donor have to be understand and support to us on the, this kinds of situation. 
That's is the I'm doing from the my heart and my understanding from the grass to do the regional level, and also the we can contribute to the global level. And also here is a many a donor, so I'm bringing them my voice for the you to hear the what the community are facing in the ground. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie, for that. Um, I really appreciated your your message that you know. I mean, as donors um, and as human rights funders, we are always wanting to think about how we can change the structural issues um, that are at play um, to really um, understand how we can make long lasting change. And I think what's important about that is that we also recognize that right now there are just such immediate needs also. There are practical needs that have to be met immediately right now. And that we also have to think you know, later about our strategic needs. So I think bringing that to us um, is a really, really important message because how do we respond in terms of um, general operating support and um, being very flexible with the money that we provide and that we are listening to you and to what you need. So I really, really do appreciate that message. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'd like to introduce um, our second video. Um, this is Grace Kamau from the African Sex Workers Alliance. I work as the regional coordinator for the African Sex Workers Alliance. Um, I'm here to talk about the, uh, the impact that COVID has had in the lives of sex workers. Uh, we as sex workers have faced a lot of uh, uh, impact in relation to COVID-19. One of the impact that you've seen as sex workers in our community is the loss of livelihood. We have lost lost livelihoods and uh, this, ha this has meant to us as sex workers to engage in unsafer sex practices. This is because oh, my apologies. Can people hear and see the video? Hear it, hear but it. not see it. Uh, Let me no, again. we can't. Pardon me. It's technical issues. Just give me one second. <laughs> no worries. Can you see the video now? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. And the donor response has been very slow. And we have also seen uh, sex workers not being able to travel from one place to another. This is because of the limited transportation across Africa. And so we as sex workers are not able to access the health care services or any prevention tools that we need. In the long term, we also speculate that we as sex workers, because uh, we have nowhere to go, our brothers have been closed, the bars have been closed where we stay and where we do our sex work. We speculate that there will be a rise of HIV and STIs because we are engaging in unsafe sex practices because we can't be able to access to prevention tools or to drugs that we are used to do or healthcare services that we are used to in our facilities. Another thing that I want to uh, talk about is I, I, you can only be paid if you're reaching out to the targets and uh, now with the COVID response all the sex workers have moved. We have also seen an increase of gender-based violence because sex workers will be forced to go and live our, with our regular partners so that we can get a shelter and food. We have also seen a, a rise of human rights violations is because the law enforcement have taken this uh, time. If you're caught anywhere standing or even if it's somewhere where on the streets waiting for a client or where somebody can just guess that you're doing sex work, someone is beaten. And this we have seen a lot of increase of human rights violations. Uh, we also want to highlight that um, sex workers have been able to come together and they have also done a lot of work together like providing food. This is the thing that we need support more than ever because even psychologically most of us are teachers because we don't have money and we don't have anywhere to go. We also want to highlight that most of the money that is in sex workers is program based. We have seen there is no emergency response when it comes to issues of sex workers. We also want to ask donors who are listening to this video that it's very important for donors to come to a rescue because we have seen that money that is given to sex workers is program-based but not AIDS-based. 
This is because we have seen very little emergency response funding for sex workers in Africa. And this is because uh, most of the funding that sex workers have is program based. So we ask uh, our donors to consider giving sex workers emergency response fund to be able to uh, respond to emergencies that arise uh, in terms of sex workers' needs. Thank you. Thanks so much, Grace, for um, your video message. And I, I want to just elevate a couple of things about what Grace said. It does link to what KT mentioned earlier, but that sex workers around the world have lost their livelihoods. And um, as Grace is saying, they, they're engaging in less safe practices as they need money to survive uh, for themselves, for their families, for their communities and also access to healthcare and prevention services have been compromised. Um, not to mention, uh, as Grace said, heightened human rights violations by state police forces targeting sex workers specifically in the name of health uh, to combat COVID-19 spread. Um, and the other thing that Grace mentioned is that the global response has been very slow. And um, there's a question in the chat from Kate about good practice around um, what donors can do to support sex worker rights organizations now. Um, and Grace was mentioning that, that most of the money that sex workers access is program based, but it's not rights based. And I think it's it, for her, it's not money that she can be able to use anywhere that she needs it now to be nimble to respond directly to the needs of her community. Um, and it's similar to what uh, KN said at the, at the top, that we need to, um, funding needs to make sense and it needs to cover real costs. With that, I'd love to introduce Cleo. Cleopatra Kambuju is the Director of Programs at Uhai Shiri, an Indigenous activist fund that resources sex workers, trans, non-binary and intersex gender minorities and LGB sexual minorities and their organizing in seven East African countries with broader strategic support to Pan-African organizing. She also serves on the steering committee of the International Trans Fund, the advisory activist board of the Australia Lesbian Foundation for Social Justice and Global Philanthropies Projects Trans Working Group and also sits on an advisory committee to provide an Afrocentric lens to trans funding and organizing on the continent. Cleo, I know that you want to speak to us a little bit more about the East African context, the government response, and, and specifically what philanthropy can do in response to, um, to Kate's question. Thanks a lot, Erin. Um, I'll, start, I'll start with a bit kind of how the pandemic has manifested itself um, in, the East in the East African countries and how governments have chosen to respond. And then I'll quickly segue into how this has affected sex work communities and their organizing. Across the seven countries that provide support, which are Uganda, Kenya, Rwanda, Burundi, Ethiopia, and DRC, there has been varied reactions from the different governments to the pandemic, ranging from no response from countries like Burundi and Tanzania to stringent response from countries like, like Uganda. Now, what is important to note is that it's not the inaction or the action of the different governments, it's the level with which marginalized communities have engaged in this response that, that will determine success or not. So in Burundi and Tanzania, where the governments have undermined the severity of the pandemic and they prioritize their national elections and or the, the economies of their countries, um, or have used strategies like the hard immunities, what this means is that they have laid their minority community as collateral. And so these are communities that also have to be disproportionately hit by HIV, and hence they have a compromised community, as Grace has mentioned, and this makes them prone to this pandemic. This is literally a socioeconomic genocide of cleansing the country of these communities that we are speaking about right now. And so it's very important for countries like Burundi, for example, that have been through so much political instability and do not have the health health infrastructure to deal with um, numbers of more people getting sick because of COVID to follow this kind of strategy and not engage the communities that will be affected um, if, they, if they engage in strategy. Um, so for these countries, it's very important to rethink their strategy, but also this reminds us about the importance of not abandoning the other health and sexual reproductive health needs. 
uh, of our communities, which actually have become more apparent, especially given that how these communities have previously been socioeconomically marginalized and or are criminalized. And so this includes things like life-saving PrEP and PEP, access to uh, ARVs, safe abortions and contraceptives. Uganda, on the other hand, has chosen to enact the toughest lockdown with night curfews, restricting all movements and closing down all by a few essential services to mitigate the pandemic. The impromptu nature in which the lockdown was implemented and the arbitrary nature in which sectors were chosen to be qualified or disqualified as essential is what dealt the hugest negative blow on our communities. Um, We've had violence, both domestic violence, as they've mentioned, as well as, well as violence from um, law enforcement officers um, in, um, militarizing the lockdown, lockdown practices. We, we've, we've not had the legal fraternity and courts being considered as a service, and it has hindered access to justice, as Chris has mentioned. I'll also speak about the moralization of this pandemic. Uh, sex work being a drive on intimacy was highly talked about as the communities that could sustain the pandemic. And there was a huge campaign to crack down on brothels and sex workers and vacate sex workers from this place. But these places also happened to be the places where sex workers also stayed. And there was no consideration of this. And I don't know if the government did not know or what, but what that meant is that sex workers actually could not sell social distance in any kind of way, because their brothers were also at the places where they stayed. And, and so with this inability to study because they didn't have housing, but also because they are, they, they are in a form of business that doesn't have any, any, uh, any form of, of netting to help them deal with the pandemic meant that they were targets um, by police officers implementing lockdown strategies. And so a lot of them got, got, have gotten arrested in Uganda, for example, and what this means is that being detained in, in two prisons that don't allow you to social distance doesn't make you safer anyway. And unlike Ethiopia that has allowed, has released up to 20,000 um, uh, prisoners over this period of time to allow for prisoners to also social distance, Uganda has followed the same similar strategy. Most recently, the prison just allowed 30, 30 um, lawyers to serve the whole country after pushback from the Uganda Law Society but we still have a lack of access to justice uh, in communities. Um, and so just to wrap up is, is, to say, is to say that, just a second, is to say that um, there is a luxury to morality when it comes to the pandemic and the crisis situation that, that the sex workers are dealing with right now. And so what needs to happen right now is there could be an opportunity for, for sex workers, but also that uh, philanthropy, part of reframing and rebooting and rebooting that normal. And the role of philanthropy right now will be how to sustain diverse civic action to be a part of rebuilding this new world beyond the cup. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Cleo. Um, I think what you mentioned at the end about philanthropy should sustain civic action um, to, to not only monitor government interventions, because we know that there's um, securitization and heightened extremism that's impacting sex workers and increased surveillance and the closing down of space, et cetera. Um, and so philanthropy should sustain civic action not only to monitor that, um, but also to rebuild the world that we want to see. Um, can I just ask you a quick follow-up question, if you don't mind, if you could answer? Um, how can donors actually sustain civic action? So what can they do now? not one year from now, not five years from now, but what would be your advice now? What we're seeing right now in, in the regions of us is that part of what's making it such that government action is not human rights sensitive or is not inclusive of civil society is the fact that there was a period in the first months of, this, of the lockdown in these countries where there was civic action paralysis that our communities weren't able to um, to perform in any kind of way. We want a very restricted civic space and COVID just to make that space even more restricted in the measure that the government were, were, were putting across. But also the way in which our movements were, were funded didn't allow them a resilience to be able to go through this lockdown. And so there's an apparent need right now for movements to have flexible funding, flexible long-term multi-year funding that allows them the ability to innovate and to respond in the many, many iterations that the pandemic presents itself because it will be a long-term situation. And I don't, I don't, as, as sex work organizing looks like right now, it has been funded on, on a piecemeal, piecemeal basis 
don't allow them um, a flexibility to be able to think about sustainability right now. And yet we need them as part of the pieces that will be rebuilding the new normal. So pushing for general support, multi-year support for our communities. Thanks, Cleo. And um, I see that others have put in some of their initiatives in the chat box. So please keep sharing those as we go. Um, the chat will be saved and, and we'll be able to collate this information um, as the Sex Worker Donor Collaborative. So please do that. And thank you, Cleo, for, for your remarks. And I'd like to introduce our third video. This is Leda Portal from Plapperts, and she represents uh, Latin America. Quisiera darles a saber lo que ha causado el COVID a nuestras poblaciones. Llegó como un golpe mortal para todas, arrebatando nuestros trabajos, nuestra libertad, encausulándonos, poniéndonos a confinamiento, a aislamiento y en cuarentena y haciendo pasar mucho hambre a nuestras familias. Creemos que el gobierno debió actuar con las poblaciones vulnerables, pero no lo hizo así. El gobierno ahora decide quién come y quién debe de vivir. Pedimos a las organizaciones internacionales que por favor nos ayuden, ya que solamente contamos con una organización internacional que la reumbrela, que de una de otra manera nos hace llegar un poquito para llegar con bolsas de víveres a nuestras compañeras y medicina. Pedimos que sean unánime todas las organizaciones internacionales, porque el COVID ha afectado totalmente a nuestras familias, destruyéndolas, destrozándolas. Tenemos compañeras muertas por el COVID, tenemos nuestros hijos enfermos, nuestros hijos están muriendo, estamos perdiendo a nuestros padres, nuestras compañeras están siendo violadas, las están matando por un plato de comida cuando los hijos lloran ellas se exponen, salen a la calle a buscar un plato de comida y las matan. Encontramos sus cuerpos destrozados, torturados, pero pasan por el COVID. No tenemos justicia. Queremos que nos escuchen y nos puedan apoyar de alguna o de otra manera. Luego pide América Latina. Thank you, Leda, for that video. Um, I just want us to take a moment to take a deep breath. Um, the impacts on families and sex workers is, is really devastating. And, and what she is asking for is that not only is funding needed that makes sense, but coordinated funding is needed, that makes sense. And so we as a donor community, as a funder community, we have to take that seriously and continue to have conversations together where we can talk amongst ourselves, get coordinated, think about what's needed in partnerships with sex worker-led organizations and networks. It's, it's absolutely critical that we open up these spaces for additional conversations and that's why we're so happy to have everybody here to, to really listen to each other, listen to what sex workers are saying, and, and, and become a more coordinated, solid unit to, to really co-conspire with sex workers. Ruth, I'd like to bring you into the conversation. Um, Ruth Morgan Thomas is the global coordinator of the Global Network of Sex Works Projects, NSWP. And Ruth has been involved in sex work for 40 years. Eight years as a full-time sex worker, two and a half years as an academic researching HIV-related links, uh, sorry, HIV-related risks in the sex industry in Edinburgh, and 30 plus years as a sex worker rights advocate campaigning for sex work to be recognized as work and developing and maintaining services and support for sex workers with a human rights and labor rights framework. 
Ruth, I know you want to speak to us a bit more about NSWP's advocacy, including an impact survey and other aspects of your work. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for joining us today. Um, our job in NSWP is to amplify the voices and the lived realities of sex workers around the world. And you will hear those voices today. But I want to focus a little bit on our advocacy around COVID to influence international and national policy responses to COVID. Um, and we were fortunate enough in the first couple of weeks after um, the pandemic really became global to be able to work with UNAIDS to produce a joint statement, which is actually one of the tools that our community are using to um, influence national governments, but also to try and help donors understand the realities of sex workers' lives. That statement highlights the fact that the criminalization of sex work magnifies the already precarious situation of sex workers around the world in this challenging time. As you've heard the sex workers say, our communities have faced a total loss of income at a time of increasing discrimination, harassment, and repression by governments and by communities. So UNAIDS has called on countries to take immediate rights affirming action to protect the health and rights of sex workers, including calling on them to halt the raids on brothels, to halt arrests, and to ensure that sex workers are included in social protection measures that governments are taking for their populations. But I hate to say that in terms of our survey, which is um, being done since the 8th of July, because we launched it on the same day as the statement. Um, and we've had 156 responses from sex workers and their organizations um, from across 55 countries. Very, very few of them are reporting that there is any sort of temporary suspension of arrests and raids. Um, some are reporting raids that are actually increasing and arrests that are based on public health legislation. So we have sex workers who are being raided in their apartments and charged with putting the public at risk. It is a mirror of what happened in the 80s and the 90s with HIV, as we see our community backed up against the wall and then being punished. And I think um, we do need people to understand the severity of the situation of sex workers being a target again and based on morals. So I would urge um, donors to think about how they fund, what they fund. At this time, our focus as NSWP has been on providing support through the regional networks and to our members at country level trying to help them build their capacity to amplify their voices through virtual platforms, because that is what we have now. We are on this today because of COVID. And yet many of our organizations are not equipped to work virtually. They don't have the money to buy the data to get online to internet. They don't have the resources and the tablets and the laptops that we in organizations and you in donors are privileged to have. And so we really have to try and focus on how do we connect people? Because at this time, more than any other, we need solidarity across our community. We need to be able to communicate. We need to be able to mobilize. We need to be able to co-conspire, as Erin says. And we rely on donors being able to support that. And I think too few donors have truly trusted sex worker-led organizations to actually be able to develop appropriate responses. And yet I will say to you, we are the only people that can develop those responses in this time. And I would urge you to trust us. Thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Ruth. Um, I wanted to ask you just a quick follow-up question mm -hmm. about um, you know, the solidarity that mm -hmm. funders can, can play and can support mm -hmm. with Tech workers. Now, what specifically um, 
would you say is a critical thing that donors need to do now? Um, so what does that trust building look like for you? Because you can say that you're trying to build trust mm -hmm. and you can say that mm -hmm. you're listening, yeah. but actually in practice, what would you say one or two things are, are indicative of that actually happening? I think actually listening to the priorities that the communities of sex workers around the world are saying. I think um, it's essential that donors actually don't try and put their priorities onto our community, but sit back and listen and allow space for a community to actually develop its own priorities and responses. So I think that's number one. I think the other, I mean, there's a, a couple of other things that I'll briefly go into. I think the need for core funding, for funding to actually run organizations is essential. You cannot start from a premise that um, because we're sex workers, we know how to run organizations, that we know how to run programs. We can learn, but we need to learn in our own way. And we don't need to learn every single donor's own particular way they want us to do things allow us to choose our own paths. And I think the other thing that I would say is that you need to recognize as donors the importance of the support that's given by national networks to members at a local level, by regional networks to those national networks and by a global network to those because we cannot do it on our own and you can fund lots of little groups and if we're not connected there is no solidarity and we can't actually amplify our voices either in countries or at international level. Thank you for those really specific things. Um, I hope everyone's taking notes because this is important and the webinar is gonna be recorded, but I think it's really, really important that we hear those specific details so we can go back and we can actually start doing some of that self-reflection. Like, is that what we're doing as a donor? Where is that showing up in our work? Um, so thank you for providing us with that. And I would really like to now introduce our fourth video, Tranjet Shanishev, and he represents the Sex Worker Advocacy Network in Central and Eastern Europe and Central Asia. My name is Trajce and I'm speaking on behalf of sex workers in Central and Eastern Europe and Central Asia. We would like to draw your attention to our concerns regarding the ongoing crisis which is deeply affecting our community. Sex workers are reporting a complete loss of income as their places of work have shut down and police curfews are enforced, leaving sex workers with no possibilities to provide for themselves and their families. The very limited government protection are not accessible to sex workers, leaving many homeless. Many of us are left with no choice but to violate curfews and continue to work in order to meet our basic needs. If we do so, we face health risk, huge fines, ill treatment and arrest. Age regression in treatment services have been decreased and accessing hormone, sexual, reproductive and mental health services is not possible. Organizations are in danger of losing funding and staff because it's not possible to move all activities online. That this means a loss of valuable human resource that cannot be easily replaced as it has taken some groups years to build their organization and capacities. Without any support from the government, the sex workers community is left to find creative ways to survive and support one another by organizing to distribute masks, sanitizers, condoms, food and connect and share housing and bills, often from their own money. We urge donors too. Show flexibility in reprogramming to address the needs of sex workers, but also secure sustainability of community-led groups. Secure continuity of community-led services during crisis. Establish emergency fund and with easy access for communities. Explore possibilities to allow budget lines for emergency response to cover basic needs such as food and medicine, but also emergency legal support. Thank you. Thank you, Trajic. I think what you've mentioned, um, reminding us that government protection measures are not accessible for sex workers, um, and at least in your region, and um, that moving services online is also not possible. 
um, for all sex workers. Uh, SWAN recently published um, a statement that calls for stronger donor engagement and support for sex workers and sex worker led organizations. And there are some specific measures that they ask for. Um, if we can put that link into the chat box for everyone, it would be wonderful for folks to get a chance to read that. Um, talking about flexibility in, in programming, um, establishing emergency funds with easy access for those most vulnerable in crisis, and, and finally, recognizing sex work as work um, and long-term support for decriminalization um, to secure labor rights for sex workers. Um, I am now going to step out of my moderator role for a moment and just speak very briefly about Global Fund for Women's work to support sex worker rights. Our new strategic plan, which kicks off July 1st, was built to shift power to gender justice movements we fund. And our new participatory grant-making model will center movement-led decision-making and was developed in consultation with our advisors, sister feminist funds, and current grantee partners. We also learned a great deal from so many other radical and self-led funds who have already doubled down on this approach, particularly in activist-led sex worker and LGBTQI funds, such as Uhai, um, who spoke, um, who Cleo spoke from Uhai. Uh, and we have three years to fully operationalize this approach. And uh, we know that we have a lot more listening and learning to do to not only show solidarity, but to ultimately shift power in terms of how and where resources are allocated. In preparation, we wrote a short position paper that's grounded in what sex workers have been telling us for years in terms of collective power, liberation, economic justice, uh, and how critical sex worker rights are in terms of agency, bodily autonomy, and self-determination. And this year, Global Fund for Women is intentionally funding sex worker-led organizing after a while of ad hoc funding. We've invited 12 sex worker-led groups for funding, including those from Kenya, Uganda, India, Romania, and South Africa. And we need to be doing a lot more, and we also need others to step up as well. And so we really, really welcome the direct conversation from, from folks on this webinar uh, so please reach out to me, reach out to the Sex Worker Donor Collaborative. Um, we are welcoming new members and we are welcoming the opportunity to grapple with things together, uh, to have courageous conversations about what it actually means to shift power, because we can say that we're doing that, but how does it actually happen? And, and support each other on our journeys to fully embrace and fund sex workers. So please consider joining us. And our last video, last but not least, is Jules Kim and she represents the Asia Pacific Network of Sex Workers. Hi, my name is Jules Kim and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Scarlet Alliance Australian Sex Workers Association and the Chairperson of APNSW, the Asia Pacific Network of Sex Workers. In Australia we're fortunate where sex work is not criminalised and therefore not considered illegal, sex workers are able to access government support just like other workers. Many sex workers have been able to access income protection from government economic relief packages. For example, individuals who've had to stop work or had their hours reduced are able to access JobSeeker and JobKeeper was introduced for employers, contractors and sole traders to support their businesses to financially survive the coronavirus situation. Unfortunately, sex work is regulated at a state level in Australia and even though sex work was first decriminalised in the world, anywhere in the world in New South Wales in 19 1995, some states still remain criminalised or legalised and licensed. And due to the varying legality of sex work across the states and territories, as well as the pervasive stigma and discrimination that exists around sex work, there are a number of sex workers who remain excluded from government financial support. Additionally, migrant sex workers, even those on lawful working visas, are not able to access any government support. For this reason, Scarlet Alliance and our member organisations have pulled together an emergency support fund for sex workers to stay safe, housed and fed during the COVID-19 pandemic. All money donated goes directly to sex workers in need, and you can find a link to the fund on chuffed.org through the Scarlet Alliance website. 
The support fund was translated into five key languages within our community, and each week a subcommittee of sex workers reviews the applications based on a self-assessment tool completed by the applicant. And every Thursday, the payments are made to the sex workers based on the donations received and the applicants made on to midnight prior on the Tuesday. Of course, the need often exceeds the available donations and each week we need to promote the fundraiser to ensure there are funds available to provide the much needed financial support for sex workers. Just unmuting myself here. Thank you, Jules. Um, I, I really um, appreciated that message. Um, you know, that in Australia, you know, she was saying they're fortunate that sex work is not criminalized. Um, and so many sex workers are many sex workers are able to access government support, um, just like other workers, but there are a number of sex workers that are excluded from that support. Um, and she mentioned migrant sex workers. And I think this just shows us that um, there are overlapping oppressions that sex workers hold in addition if they, if they hold an additional stigmatizing identity. And so we need to really question um, programming, specifically government programming and who is left out because nine times out of 10, um, somebody is going to be left out because of implicit bias, stereotyping, targeted discrimination, et cetera. So I really appreciated hearing that. And um, I hope that we can potentially get back to the emergency fund um, that Scarlet Alliance is creating um, in our uh, question and answers that we are going to start now. Um, I'm really happy that um, Red Umbrella Fund and Third Wave Fund have added um, information in the chat box about their participatory grant making and also um, their response to COVID-19. So please take a look at the chat. Um, I'm going to ask that we put the slide up of our speakers um, as we facilitate the Q&A. And if you have any questions for anyone on the panel, please ask now, put it in the chat. Um, if you have questions for those who presented on video today, we can put you directly in touch with them. Just let us know if you would like to do that. So while we get the questions going, um, I'd like to ask Ruth something specifically, um, but actually I'd like to bring um, Cleo in as well and Katie. Uh, and we talked about this a little bit already, um, but you know, this, this crisis has really laid bare uh, the inequalities um, that we are seeing and the way that the world just doesn't work. The world is not working and specifically for sex workers. Um, and I just, I want to know, um, you know, we've talked about consciousness raising, we've talked about advocacy, and um, there are some tips for funders in terms of funding. Um, but apart from actual funding, are there other strategies that funders can do right now to support sex workers? And I'll just open it up um, to see if any one of our speakers wants to jump in um, with a comment on that. I'm happy to take first shot at that that one. I I do think that donors, um, even when they are wanting to provide funding, sometimes the processes are incredibly complex and cumbersome, and it's very difficult to move rapidly. And I think one of the things that we all need to learn to do, and I include NSWP in that, is to actually be able to have systems that are more flexible, that can cope with emergency systems, um, emergency responses like this. So I think that for me is, is something that we all need to learn to do, not just the donors, but to, to be able to speed up and to actually respond in emergency situations at an appropriate time. Thanks, Ruth. Yeah, I definitely. We definitely all need to be able to be more nimble and speed up and, and be more responsive, um, for sure. And we really have to ask ourselves those hard questions. Like, what is it about our institutions that delay our, our ability to respond rapidly um, and, and really interrogate that as, as donors and take that seriously? Mm -hmm. Cleo, Katie, any uh, additional points you wanted to raise around that question specifically? 
Yeah. Um, okay, um, if, I, if I speak about the humanitarian assistance, part of how COVID response has come to our region has been through humanitarian relief aid through the bilateral uh, relations that um, our countries do share with the global north. Now the problem is six, of us, six out of seven countries uh, in the region in, in, in East Africa do criminalize um, sex work, sex work, uh, and, and so it's not possible to organize this work, and it's very difficult to reach the community if it's already um, criminalized, and has been blamed um, for the pandemic as it has been um, in, in East Africa, and so. For us, I think would be the spaces that funders do occupy, like what we're doing right now, that speak to donor collaboration and that speak to developing advocacy, particularly when it comes to engaging the development sector, that does look at the business sense of things and not the human rights sense of things. And so what is the relation between the social and the economic in pushing the, the dial around social justice? Um, this is a combat that might need to go on board to bridge the gap between the human rights world and the justice world and some donor collaboration. This might be something that would help change things moving forward um, in mm -hmm. anticipation of any other mishap like this one. Yeah, I think that's that's really great. And I think those are the types of discussions that we we want to have at the Sex Worker Donor Collaborative. Um, so, so for folks who are interested in, in talking about that, those are the kinds of things that we, we grapple with. How do we extend um, our, our work and how do we reach and how do we talk to other sectors about the needs of sex workers? So I think that's a great Cleo um, and something that I think we really need to, to dive a little bit deeper into in our collaborative. Um, I'm, I'm seeing some questions coming in on the chat. Um, I want to uplift one question here about crowdsourcing. So Susanna, is asking um, that a lot of activists are using crowdsourcing um, and to address immediate needs. There was um, uh, mention of mutual aid funds um, on um, with some of the videos that we saw. So how can donors amplify those efforts? Katie, are you still with us? Did you want to um, jump in on this question specifically about how donors can amplify crowdsourcing? and mutual aid funds for sex workers? Yeah, so I have a, some of the note also to the says, which is I have not seen previously also. I think it's the, for the donor where a work, uh, it's the working in collaboration or partnership or fund out or the grantee. I think it's that they had the co-funding is the, co-funding is the important for the sex worker organization and also the network as well as is that they have also the emergency response fund should be flexible if it is like the the time is like this and also i have the one of the thing was also the donor should be listened from the sex worker community what we are facing day by day it's not only hearing from us that is the one of the thing because and during the, this time, what the sex worker in the ground are facing, the problem was the, and during this time, you know, is when, when we request, donor might think that we are asking for the PPE, um, how we will do it. They had the no outreach activity. But in the grassroots level, in the ground, the, what community are facing, the government is charging the who is not wearing the mask, charging the fine. So mm -hmm. if it, even the, the sex worker, they do not have the income and they cannot buy the mask and they cannot, they have to pay the fine. So if the donor, like the, in the supporting to the emergency fund on the, these kinds of issue, that will be also held. Out. So then the sex worker have to be protect themselves and also the uh, protect to the other and make sure that their family are also safe. So then the sex worker community, uh, the organization can provide for their necessary uh, support to the sex worker community. Mm, That's why I was missing the previous part. And also the one more thing was the, I mean, is the, we are here in the global fund, is the uh, providing the 5% or the national funding for the, they can ask for the request to 
to respond to COVID, but that is also going to the, uh, the government and also the principal recipient, not to the sex worker mm -hmm. organization or the community organization. We hear that they had the 5% allocation for the respondent for emergency response to the COVID, but the community organization had not able to assess. And also another thing is also for the human rights organization or the supporting for the human rights uh, human rights defender, I think it's the more emphasis to be support to the sex worker organization. I'm giving the example of the global fund. They had the component for the human rights uh, component, but the, in the global fund, in most of the country going to the government and also the peer. So they more focus on the HME response, not on the uh, humanitarian and needs of the sex worker or the human rights response. So that's in the, these, the sex worker donor collective how, uh, can consider the, how you can support the sex worker community and sex worker organization and network effectively. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. I really appreciate that response. Um, we have 15 minutes left. There are some continual questions coming in. Uh, the next one I wanted to raise um, is how can funders build back better? for sex workers. So not necessarily asking about massive structural issues, um, but what are the top things they can change in their systems? So I'm understanding this as donor operations, grant making, what can they change in their systems and what helpful changes should they retain post COVID? So now we're talking about COVID being a moment in time where we can change our systems and what do we need to retain to be more responsible um, and more um, co-conspiratory funders. Does anyone want to jump in? I know we've talked about this, but I think it's good to, to bear more time to talk about specific systematic changes that donors can make. Cleo, do you want to jump in um, from an activist-led fund perspective in terms of what specifically UHI has been able to do um, in terms of your systems? And maybe you didn't need to change anything. So tell us what's so great about your systems and if, if there are some things, what you've been able to change if necessary. Yes, um, thank you so much. And we're learning. Um, I mean, one thing, um, and this is something we thought about at the beginning of our of this pandemic is when we, especially when we are reaching out to, diff, to, to our different partners is that none of us were built to function in a pandemic uh, and so this 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 has called on us to think about how adaptable our programming is and, and not just as but also for our partners and and sustainability um and for us our hugest thing that we have relied on to adapt our systems is lesson and so there's been a huge piece of our grant making that has really spoken of the beyond this. It speaks of a huge human resource, a, a, a sizable human resource that requires you to be able to listen and process, um, me meaning moving beyond listening to seeing how that transform, how translates, in, how that translates into how different your programming is like. Um, I'm now in the end, a couple of the things that you've all spoken about have happened, which includes um, a flexibility that allows us to provide the kind of, of support that would be useful in terms of quantity, but also in terms of the caveats around that support. Now we are public foundation, meaning that we do, for, we do source for funds to also be able to make funds. And what that means is that um, we do have to negotiate our own, our own relationships with our, with, our, with our other partners. And so on the flip side of our, of our relationships is that we have continued to engage in spaces like this, and with our partners on a one-to-one -one basis to see how we can renegotiate our relationships, um, and speak about the, the role of sustainable community development and, and what that could look like um, during, this, um, during this pandemic. And the importance of sustaining civic action beyond, beyond the cap to be present on the other side. One thing spoke about that um, it, in the rebuilding of the new normal, it will be important that, c that civic civic actors like we've been supporting are present to be able to rebuild that new normal, or else it will be repeated in a different kind of way that 
that um, undermines the investments that we've made as donors to these mm -hmm. to these movements in the past. Um, and so one of the things that's coming up that Aduha will be doing, for example, is a repurposing of our, of our peer grants that is determining communities by repurposing it so that it doesn't speak of specific projects, but specific, speaks only of general support. And that allows movement kind of, of flexible support that they would need over these curves. Um, continuously listening as everyone has been saying. Mm. Thanks, Cleo. Um, and I, I want to jump into another question uh, around research. There's a question about um, ethical research. And the question is, following the challenges of COVID or what we're seeing, what are some guidelines for carrying out ethical research with sex workers, especially in communities that have been made much more vulnerable um, and have potentially reduced capacity for participation. So in order to get um, information, uh, we'd like to do research. So what is um, your thoughts on that? And I'm wondering, um, Ruth, you did an impact mm -hmm. today. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any you know, considerations around ethical research at this time? I have many <laughs> um, because I'm also editing um, along with some academics and community members who are writing as authors a, a book. And I think one of the topics is around what are the ethic ethics of, of research. I do think there's a very interesting model in Kenya that people mm -hmm. should consider trying to support going much broader. So KESWA, the national network, has developed its own ethics committee that it requires others to submit their research proposals and it's reviewed by a group of sex workers from whichever community um, is the subject of research to mm -hmm. determine whether or not that is something the community wishes to have done. Mm -hmm. And I do think that we need community-led ethics approval not just organizational approval for research they want to do or academic approval which is incredibly difficult to get if it's about human subjects and we are human so um, but i do think we need to partner with communities um, in the way that we have been trying to do with the springer book and katie is one of the authors on that um, so i think it's it's a really strong model to actually make sure that you work with the community about the research and that you allow them to lead that research. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth, for that. Um, I wanted to ask everyone as we slowly close out our webinar today about looking forward um, to our feminist futures. And so I wanted to give uh, all three speakers a chance just to weigh in on this particular question. Um, you know, what does a feminist future look like to you? So this is blue sky, this is, this is the ultimate goal. I mean, we're dreaming big here because we need to recreate what we want to see in the world. Uh, so what does the feminist future look like to you in terms of sex worker rights in this new COVID-19 world? Katie, do you wanna start us off? Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> no yes, worries. I, <laughs> yes, I can. I think it's the during the, this COVID time, what we have learned was the it's not about the the community who are we who are identify ourselves or the people identify us. This is about the issue of the humanitarian and unity and how we need to be respond on the needs of us, the human. And I also see that, um, I mean, to be honest, previously I was not quite sure about the, what is the feminism. And I thought that this is the, just um, understand on the, what we have a belief. But when I, when I do the online study about the feminism, then I start learning about the is feminism is the we have to be support each other. It's not about on the what you want to be on your own principle or you believe. 
we have to be come out with the either man or woman or you know it's the it's as the human as the human and as the people and we have to support each other and we can make sure that everyone is equal opportunity so that's i see so in in the during this covid time what i it's very interesting i see that they had no stigma no discrimination about you are old or you are young or you are men everyone faced the same problem so this is one of the good opportunity for the extra learning in the during the pandemic time so in the future we should think about the how we have to be work together and how we have to be make sure and supporting each other not about who you are what is your identity and where you are living what is your skill that does not matter if the the pandemic is coming then it will be affect to all of us not only skin not only where you live or wh whoever you are so that's good that's the good of thing positive thing i see thanks katie ruth or cleo who wants to go next I'm, I'm fine going next if Cleo's not ready yet. So, so for me, I think it's a, a really interesting question. As you heard in my introduction, I am really quite old. And I've been a feminist since I was just a teenager. And I believe that feminism was about our rights to make our own choices, to make our own decisions, to have bodily autonomy. And that applied to everybody. And so when I was 17, before I became a sex worker, I was advocating for the rights of strippers to work um, against people in the political party that I was a member of. And for me, a future will be where we allow people to decide who they want to be, what they want to be, and where they want to be. Um, and I think for me, there is a, a reality check about parts of the women's rights movement who decry us as being traitors, who say that we are simply colluding in patriarchy through our work, deny our right to bodily autonomy and to make choices. None of us in this movement think that sex work is the best job ever. We all are aware even those that work in incredibly privileged settings, how challenging this work can be, and at times how dangerous this work can be. But we believe in a society that will offer us the same protection as it will offer other human beings, because we're not a separate species. And to me, I will go into a room and be able to hold my head up high or walk down a street and be respected as an equal, not as the whore that many people see me as. Thank you, Ruth. Cleo, any last thoughts on feminist futures? And then I'll close us out. Yeah, um, I think particularly from COVID is one of the things I've been able to appreciate is that there is, there is a luxury to morality when it comes to um, pandemics and crises like this. Um, as Ohio, for the past 10 years, we've lived by, um, by the vision to live and embody re revolutionary love. And as, as we are moving forward, we are thinking about the fact that it should, as Ruth has said, it shouldn't be re revolutionary. Like, like the most revolutionary thing is that it shouldn't be revolutionary it is to be. And so we live, we live, for, we live to see a world in which our communities are able to live fulfilling, healthy, and safe lives of self-determination, dignity, justice, and equality, uh, whatever that means to them. Um, that's, that's the feminist feature that we envision as Ohio. Thank you so much for answering that question. I want to say thank you to um, all of the speakers today. Uh, we want to continue to have these conversations. Um, there are so many additional questions that we could answer, um, but we don't have time to today. But it's important that we keep the conversation going. Stay tuned for additional content from us. Um, you'll be hearing from us with additional resources and a specialized list of what you can do right now is actually on the Sex Worker Donor Collaborative website.
please join us. Big thank yous to our video editor, Patrick Arias, Kara, Ankit, and Jen for their social media expertise, everyone at NSWP and the Sex Worker Donor Collaborative, and finally for you for joining us today. Um, I'd just like to close us out with a quote from the sex worker pop-up that happened in New York City before the shelter in place was announced. And it was written on a wall to honor black and brown sex workers from around the world. And you'll see KN there featured in front. And Vinielle says, when your very existence is criminalized, survival becomes a radical action. Thank you everyone for joining us. Take care. Bye-bye.